I told some of your leaders backstage a little while ago for me to come here and talk to you about free enterprise is like saving souls in heaven. But you know, I've always believed in the old adage so common in America and so accepted here that if you build a better mousetrap, the world will be a path to your door. Unfortunately these days, if you build a better mousetrap, the government comes along with a better mouse. All of us, all of us are disturbed. We've heard and we believe, we know that you can't take it with you. And today we know why because it goes before you do. <laughs> the... I would like to talk to you. You who are truly practitioners of free enterprise about the whole problem of the marketplace and government as an institution, government's relationship to it. Now, I know that all business and industry in America are in the deepest trouble they've ever been in our entire national history. And I'm speaking not only of the obvious difficulties of the present economic dislocation and the capital shortage brought about by excessive government spending, but the wave of contempt and almost hatred, born of ignorance, that is abroad in the land toward this system we call capitalism. It is a system spark plugged by the hope of economic reward that has taken the burdens off the backs of more people than any other system the world has ever known. And yet today, every economic and social ill in our society are blamed on the pursuit of profit. Some would curtail private property rights in the name of environmental protection. Those proclaiming consumerism declare that the very word profit is synonymous with evil. And they've all forgotten the very simple truth that profit, property and freedom are inseparable and you cannot possibly have the third without the first two. I stood backstage, I heard the wonderful presentation out here from the back of the screen looking through it, I could see the slides of this country of ours and I had to think, it's very easy to sound extremely critical and downbeat when you are talking about the subject of this kind. But then I remember the words of Abraham Lincoln, who said it is possible to love your country and still disapprove of the policies of its government and those entrusted with those policies. <laughs> of late, we've neglected to teach so economics in our schools, and a whole generation of our sons and daughters are growing up with little understanding of how this institution works. And if this lack of understanding is not soon corrected, we may do ourselves irretrievable harm by demanding even more interference from government than we already have. And I think we should be aware that when government involves itself in things that are not government's proper province, it is something less than a howling success. Now we could read an example in one of those socialist countries in Eastern Europe where bureaucracy has grown up and government has taken full charge and what happens when government has to solve the problems by itself? They were faced with a simple holiday problem. And they issued an edict that because Christmas Eve falls on Thursday, Thursday has been designated a Saturday for work purposes. The factories will be closed all day with the stores open a half a day only. Now that doesn't sound bad if they'd stop there. But that's the trouble with bureaucracy. It doesn't stop. So they went on. Friday has been designated a Sunday with both factories and stores closed all day. Monday will be a Wednesday for work purposes. Wednesday will be a business Friday. Saturday will be Sunday and Sunday will be Monday. I don't know whether they ever did get back in the regular calendar again. But of course that's one of those Iron Curtain countries. We wouldn't do anything like that. Not here, in free America. Let me read you a few lines from the Internal Revenue Code that are designed to make it easier for you to figure out your income tax every April. <laughs> Section 509. 
For purposes of paragraph 3, an organization described in paragraph 2 shall be deemed to include an organization described in section 501C, subparagraphs 4, 5, and 6, which would be described in paragraph 2 if it were an organization described in paragraph 3. We live in the only country in the world where it takes more brains to figure out the tax than it does to earn the income. But would it surprise you to know that in this land of the free, business is more regulated today than in any country in the world where free enterprise is still allowed to exist in any form. We've played fast and loose with a system that released for the first time virtually in all man's history. The individual genius of man to perform such miracles of invention, construction, and production has never been seen. We had in our early years and until the last few decades limited government and the ultimate and individual freedom consistent with an orderly society. One half of the economic activity in the entire history of mankind has taken place in these 200 years in this country. But someplace along the line we seem to have lost faith in the system and in ourselves. On every hand, people who should know better, people in positions of leadership and influence advocate more government and less freedom as the solution to our problems. And very soon, if we're not careful, we'll have a country where everything that isn't prohibited is compulsory. Organized labor exerts a force on government that wouldn't be tolerated for one minute if it were attempted by management demands statutes to enforce privileges that they should be seeking from management at the free and open negotiating table. But management too has been guilty of turning to government for answers it might better provide for itself. It's supported and obtained legislation which all too often interferes with the free rhythm of the marketplace and lessens competition. And government has loved every minute of it. Because government has, as history has shown, a built-in ability to grow, always to grow, never to voluntarily reduce itself in size or power. The number of government employees, federal, state, and local, is growing twice as fast as the increase in population. And in the last 10 years, the cost of the public payroll has increased seven times as fast as the increase in numbers. When we began this century, 75 years ago, there were 26 people employed in this country for every public employee, federal, state, and local. Today, the ratio is four to one, about four and a half to one to be accurate. If we continue for the next 25 years, we will end the century with a ratio of one to one or less, except that you and I know by that time, free enterprise will have ceased to exist. The other day, some chilling figures were given to us. There are 71 and a half million of us employed in private enterprise, making our living out in the free marketplace. There are 80 and a half million Americans receiving some form of check from government. Those who earn and produce are outnumbered by nine million. Can the system continue under that? There's never been a greater need for an informed citizenry because there's never been a greater lack of awareness of how the system works. Not too long ago, a nationwide poll was taken of college and university students. It found that 76% of them blamed business in America for every problem, social and economic. 76% of them said that the answer lay in complete government regimentation from production to marketing of private business. And then in the same poll of these thousands of bright young people, 80% of them said, we want less government interference in our private lives. And they didn't understand the inconsistency. Another poll has found that the citizenry of this country are angrier at government than they've been at any time in the history of polling. They're angry at government, but less than half of them can name their United States congressman. And of those who can name him, 86% cannot tell you a single thing about him other than his name. They know nothing he stands for, what he represents, how he votes, or anything else. Now, government by the people is only going to work when the people work at it, as apparently you've decided to do. But what we have to understand and then make others understand is, 
that we're governed more and more not by those we elect to public office, but by middle echelon bureaucrats who cannot be removed from their jobs by the voters, and more and more the most powerful lobbies in our nation's capitals are coming to be the organizations of public employees. Most legislation has its origin in the agencies and departments of government. It does not come, as we've been led to believe, by a spontaneous demand from the public. It is government itself that thinks these up, and Congress is faced with 30,000 proposals each year for new laws and programs. And if most of them were lost on their way to the printers, we'd all be better off. Sometimes, sometimes I think the only thing that we can be thankful for is government's waste and extravagance. Can you imagine how miserable we'd be if we were getting all the government we're paying for? <laughs> right now, Congress is having a second go at a consumer advocacy measure, which will give government more control over you, over business, over the American people, and even over other government agencies than anything we've ever known. The proponents of government intervention never stop. A land planning bill was introduced, just defeated for its second time, and it's back again, turned around, redressed a little bit, but presented. They never stop. If passed, it will violate all our concepts of local planning. It will violate our tradition of private property ownership more than anything that's ever been done. It'll be back, as I said before. A government program once conceived is the nearest thing to eternal life we'll ever see on this earth. Once passed, all the programs are administered by a bureaucracy that's beyond the control of the Congress that originally created it. Because all of the legislative proposals for new programs contain a line that reads pretty much this way. It's kind of pro forma. It says, the agency entrusted with implementing this program shall make such regulations as it deems necessary. And not even the Office of Management and Budget knows today how many bureaus, agencies, and commissions there are. But the regulations they've spawned amount to around 25,000 each year, new ones added on top of the others. We're a nation of laws. If we're charged with murder, we're innocent, unless and until we can be proven guilty by the state beyond reasonable doubt. But we've become a nation of regulations with thousands and thousands more regulations than there are laws. And if you break a regulation, you are guilty as charged. And the agency bringing the charge is judge, jury, and executioner. And only your only recourse is to take them to court, and the burden of proof of innocence is on you. You remember speaking of business that fuss over cyclamates a few years ago? Do you remember when all the soft drinks artificially sweetened by non-fattening sweetener had to be taken off the shelves and poured down the drain because the Federal Drug Administration said they were hazardous to our health? Well, now, a couple of years later, the Federal Drug Administration has quietly, very quietly whispered, they think they may have acted too soon, that they were a little hasty. It seems they were feeding 20 rats cyclamates, and three of them developed tumors suspected of being malignant. But it also seems that the amount of cyclamates they were being fed, if a human being took the same proportionate amount, you'd have to drink 875 bottles of soft drink a day. Now, I suggest drinking 875 bottles of anything a day is hazardous to your health. <laughs> Just a short time ago, a major drug firm only had to submit about 70 pages of data with its application to license a new drug. More recently, that same company has submitted an application and trucks carried 73,000 pages of scientific data to the Federal Drug Administration. It will be several years before they will know whether the drug can be licensed. This has reduced the development of health-giving drugs and medicines in America by 60%. It's raised the cost by almost a half a billion dollars to the consumers, and it has created a drug lag in which proven drugs are being used in other countries of the world years before they can be applied here in America, and we can now count accurately the death toll that takes place here in the misery and suffering because of this drug lag. Small businessmen spend 130 million man hours a year doing required paperwork and it adds 50 billion dollars a year to the cost of doing business, all of which must be added into the price of the product. 
Then the customer is also taxed to pay $20 billion the cost for government's handling of all that paper. This year, business in America will send enough paper to Washington to fill 50 baseball stadiums from the dugout to the top row of the stadium. And it's 20% more than was required last year. A congressman was upset when he discovered that government is spending $4 billion on scientific research, but it doesn't know where it's being done, what's being done, or how many projects there are. I like to tell him about one that I know about. It's called the demography of happiness. They have learned that young people are happier than old people. They've learned that you're happier if you earn more than if you earn less. And they've learned that you're happier if you're well than if you're sick. $249,000 to find out it's better to be young, rich, and healthy than old, poor, and sick. And of course, most of this is done in the name of emergency. Always there is a crisis. We've had an experience with a recent oil shortage. Congress immediately rang with cries for government solutions, rationing, then controls. Then they urged punitive taxes when they should have been proposing incentives, which went witch hunting for a scapegoat when they should have been looking for oil. And then finally came that beloved proposal of government, the answer that government should go in the oil business. Well, we'd better think twice any time government proposes that. Let me give you a little history and bring it up to date to show you the comparison between government and the private sector. 35 years ago, you could make a telephone call long distance from San Francisco to New York City for $20.70. And for that same amount of money, you could go down to the post office and buy 1,036 stamps and send 1,036 letters across the country. Now today, 35 years later, you can make that telephone call for 56 cents. And for that amount, you can only send five letters. So the government is suing the phone company. <laughs> but how has this all come about? For one thing, because I think all of us have been so busy that we've left each other each target to fight alone. Right now, Congress considers legislation that would allow the government to appoint two members to the board of directors of each oil company. Does anyone really believe that if that succeeds, it will stop there? Does anyone believe that in the business in which you find yourselves will not pretty soon be deemed by government to be of national interest, public welfare, and therefore worthy of having government interference of this kind? How many years have we let the doctors fight the battle against socialized medicine and the threat of it, but the battle is still there, it's closer, it's more imminent than it has ever been? It's time the rest of us ask ourselves if we can socialize the doctor without socializing the patient. Now, long before, before I thought I might ever hold public office, I used to speak to groups not exactly like this. You're kind of a first experience and a wonderful one. But I used to express my concern that government was growing beyond the consent of the governed. Now I've been a part of government for eight years, and I'm more frightened than I was before, because I know what's being planned in the marble halls of government. I know how desirous government is of imposing even more restrictions on the private enterprise sector. Any effort to free business from the stranglehold of government today must be led by the people of this country, by people like yourselves, private entrepreneurs, the true capitalists of this country, by independent business, and by, yes, those in the management of the great corporations. In the last 40 years, I know that government will not help preserve free enterprise. It's sought only in these 40 years to control and to regulate not only the free market system, but each individual business. And we can't say it's gotten away with this in spite of business, because particularly in the area of big business, too many have admitted finally that they think a little interference with government by government is not all bad. A little regulation lessens competition after all, and a little subsidy can be justified as helping preserve free enterprise. And it's time for all of us in this country to ask ourselves and ask each other if we really want free enterprise, if we want to compete in a free market, or are we now so regulated that we've given up and abandoned the fight as hopeless? 
The funny thing is, that's what Karl Marx said we'd do. He said that his theory was inevitable, that we would give in step by step. Well, it isn't hopeless. The bill repealing the mandatory interlock devices on auto ignitions last year tells you just what can happen. You know what that, you remember how annoyed you were if you had a new car? You couldn't back it out of the garage without fastening up the harness and listening to that buzzer until you got it fastened up. You couldn't turn on the motor. And the people of this country spoke back in outrage and Congress didn't wait a minute and a half to change it. Of course, it so happened that we had to pay in the price of the car for installing that, and then we had to turn around and pay the increased price for taking it out. But there is a long list of causes where there's been no outrage, where businesses refuse to fight back. Too many examples of big business contributing to and catering to incumbents in the hope that they will be remembered kindly. Now, this policy is known as feeding the crocodile, hoping he'll eat you last. But eat you he will. I don't know whether any of you in your particular work run afoul of OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. This has taken us one big step nearer the police state. It increases the cost of goods and services for all consumers. In two years of its existence, it issued regulations that would fill a 17-foot shelf of books. Now, you can remember that it only took a five-foot shelf of books for the Harvard Classics, 15 minutes a day to a college education. But this was just two years of rules. Businessmen complained, but only to each other. Where is the real opposition to OSHA demanding a halt? I have told you about the cost of the charge to businessmen of doing business with the government, all of it which must be paid by the consumer. But the time has come to fight back. Incidentally, I have to tell you one about OSHA because it came close to my own neighborhood out there. This was a businessman who was told by OSHA he had to install separate men's and women's washrooms for his employees. He only has one employee. And at home they sleep in the same bed and use the same bath. They're married. I'm not down at work. They got separate rooms down there. But the time has come to fight back against those who would throw this free market system aside. And truth is on our side. It's our sword and shield. We have to bring the truth to our customers, to our families and friends, and above all, to our own sons and daughters who have been taught too many economic fairy tales in too many classrooms. You take... On Thursday night, I was in a seminar, a debate in Washington, D.C. with a United States Senator. And he referred to one of the widely held cliché beliefs in America about the necessity of imposing taxes on the business and on the big corporations to make the burden easier for the little man. Well, isn't it about time that we made people understand that business doesn't pay taxes? Business collects taxes very efficiently. But every tax must be passed on as a cost of production in the price of the product, and it winds up that the same old John Joe public pays that tax when he buys the product. I have said this on a number of college campuses. It's a, it's a kind of demagoguery, and I have said this on college campuses and seen the look of unbelief on the young people's faces. And so I've tried this example. I give it to you. I said, wait a minute. Let's take something that is so necessary that even the poorest person must have it. The staff of life, a loaf of bread. There are 151 taxes in a loaf of bread accounting for more than half the price of the product. And then I say they begin, if you doubt that, with the farmer who raised the wheat. If he cannot get enough money for his wheat to pay the property tax on his farm, he's no longer a wheat farmer. And so it goes with the trucker and his business expenses and taxes that he hauls at the market to the mill where it is milled and on up the line and who pays them all, including the farmer's property tax, the fellow that buys the loaf of bread. Now, if we make business collect too many, business becomes non-competitive and is priced out of the market. And that's what's happening to the United States on the world market. But government loves these hidden taxes because the citizen isn't aware of the real cost of government. And you imagine a howl that would be raised if just one year, governments, federal, state, and local, didn't collect the regular taxes. But at the end of the year, they came around and handed you a single bill 
for the cost of government. Well, when the revolution finally was over, <laughs> no, the, um, the great majority of Americans, when asked to estimate how much government cost them in total, only come within about a third of guessing the proper cost. Governments today are taking almost half of every dollar earned in the United States. It's time to explode the myth about inflation. Business doesn't cause it. When your prices have to go up, you're not the cause of inflation. Labor doesn't cause it by trying to keep pace with the cost of living. Inflation has one cause and one cause alone. When government continues to spend more money than government takes in, we have inflation. And the answer is a balanced budget. And balancing the budget is, it's hard, but it's not impossible. It's a little like protecting your virtue. You have to learn to say no. Now those in and out of Congress today who would switch from fighting inflation to fighting recession, and that's what we've been doing, have started us down the road to disaster. You can't eliminate poverty by giving everyone more money if there is not a comparable increase in things to buy with that money. So what we should be doing is reminding the Congress that if they solve the recession in the manner in which they're going about it, we will face a recession twice as great, more unemployment, and more double-digit inflation greater than we've had in these past two years down the road in another two or three years until one day we come to the cliff we fall off and it's too deep for us ever to get out again. With all the doom and gloom, read, read, which creates the fear of the unknown, I have thought for a long time that the business leadership in this country should ask for a meeting with the communications media. Not, I'm not suggesting to whitewash business or cover up any sins that might be committed in the name of free enterprise. But to ask if the free media, the communications media, doesn't also have a stake in giving the people a more realistic picture of what it's all about. And they should be reminded. They should be reminded that while we agree we cannot have freedom, individual freedom, without a free press, they can't have a free press without a free economy. And today, by whatever means, it cannot be denied that public opinion has been molded into an anti-capitalist mentality. The doom criers are in full voice and they've created an atmosphere of uncertainty and fear. And this is a psychological factor in economics. For every man that's laid off in a recession, there are a dozen going to work every day wondering if it's going to happen to them. And that means that when you come around to sell your products, you're coming into an atmosphere where because of fear, they're thinking they should put off buying, should postpone, and if enough people put off buying, we deepen the recession and we deepen the trouble we're in. And it's all born of a psychology of fear. Wouldn't it be nice if the labors of the leaders of all of these groups and of management and labor could have a summit meeting, an exchange of facts? All due respect, I think we might find that they would all come out a little better informed and we would all be a little better off. You know, when I talk about this psychology, John Kenneth Galbraith, who in my opinion is living proof that economics is an inexact science, has written a new book called Economics and the Public Purpose. And in this book, he asserts that the market arrangements of our free enterprise system have given us inadequate housing, terrible mass transit, poor health care, and a host of other miseries. And then for the first time, this man who for many years has been a voice of liberalism comes out from behind the shield of liberalism and presents himself now as believing that only socialism will solve the problems confronting us. He deals in fairy tales. Let's look at the history of this country. One half of the economic activity, as I've said, takes place, has taken place in these 200 years. But look at even a single lifetime, my own. The advances under a free system in nutrition, in health knowledge, in medical care. I have already lived 10 years longer than my life expectancy when I was born. That's a source of annoyance to a number of people. <laughs> You who go into so many homes, just think of this. When I was born, 
90% of the people in this country live below what is called the poverty line today. Today, you go into homes in which the figure is less than 10%, but you go into homes in which 95% of the people of this country have the daily minimum intake of nutrients essential to maintain health. 99% of the kitchens in America have gas or electric appliances. 96% of the homes have television. We own 120 million automobiles and trucks. And to those people who say, but that's just an evidence of your materialism, we're also the most generous people on earth. We have shared our wealth more widely among our people than any society ever known. With voluntary contributions and giving, we support more churches, more libraries, more operas, more nonprofit theaters and symphonies, and publish more books than all the rest of the world put together. One third of all the young people in the world who are getting a college education are getting it in the United States. And we have more doctors and hospitals in proportion to population than any other nation on earth. Now, is this what Dr. Galbraith would have us eliminate? Is this the system that is a failure to be thrown away and exchanged for something else? And if it is, then let him face us with a concrete example and not theoretical arguments. And we have a concrete comparison. We have two great classic uh, comparison between two great nations, our own and a nation on this earth that has a greater land mass, rich with natural resources, 250 million capable people, and for almost 60 years they have been free without hindrance or interference to fully implement all the principles of Karl Marx's complete socialism and communism in that country. And we could be just like them. We would have to start by cutting our paychecks 80%, move 33 million of us back to the farm, destroy 59 million television sets, tear up 14 out of 15 miles of highway and two-thirds of our railroad track, junk 19 out of 20 automobiles, knock down 70% of our houses, rip out nine-tenths of our telephones, and then find a capitalist country that would sell us wheat on credit so we wouldn't starve. <laughs> We're going to do that, I'd have stopped right there and wouldn't have anything more to say. <laughs> but you know, the other day, George Meany, before a congressional committee, declared war on tax reform that would allow business and industry to accumulate more capital for investment and expansion that would create more jobs. Now, I'm sure that Mr. Meany was sincere when he cries for more government spending, more pump, pump priming to create jobs. But he's as far off base as Dr. Galbraith is. He's not only fighting the one thing that will provide jobs for the working men and women of this country, but at the same time, he is again, as I said, going against that idea of who pays the taxes in this country. The distinguished economist Ludwig von Mises said, a social system, however beneficial, cannot work if it is not supported by public opinion. And that's where you come in, because this is where we must talk to each other. No government can possibly match or afford the kind of talent that is abroad in the private sector of this country. What if in a great spirit of kind of a noblesse oblige, that great power could be turned to solving some of the more pressing problems? What if instead of sitting back and just complaining at government and turning to the same bureaucrats who've made the mistake in the first place, asking them to correct it, business turned some of its talent sort of on the side as a hobby into solving these? coming up with an answer and then going to government and saying here is a solution to the problem that is within the framework of the free enterprise system that doesn't require a change in our society. We could start with that great sacred cow social security. Here is an economic time bomb. It is ticking its way toward a disastrous economic blow up. It's a roadblock to prosperity of the working man. It offers fifth rate term and liability insurance at three or four times what it would cost in the open market. 
And if American business and industry couldn't come up with a better idea than that, they wouldn't be in business. Now, if I could use, if I could use a personal experience, I think I speak with some knowledge of the contribution that you can make in this way to government. Because eight years ago, I took over an, a government in California that was spending a million and a half dollars a day more than it was taking in. It was on the verge of bankruptcy. It was growing in size by 5,000 to 7,000 new employees each year. Welfare was increasing by 40,000 cases a month. And we turned to the business community of California. And some of the most gifted people in our state voluntarily gave up an average of 117 days apiece full time to form themselves into task forces based on their particular skills and knowledge and go into every department and area of state government to see how modern business practices could be put to work to make government more efficient. They came back to us with 18, more than 1,800 recommendations. We implemented more than 1,600 of those. And a few months ago, we turned over to the new administration for the first time in a quarter of a century that a new government in California had received such a thing. We turned over a balanced budget, a $500 million surplus, the same number of employees we'd had eight years before, 400,000 fewer people on welfare. And we'd given back... time for us to realize that we, the people, have the answers. And we are in a worldwide ideological contest in which the world is being forced into a choice between the free marketplace that has blessed us beyond measure and the deadly dullness of socialism. Now there are those in our midst who suggest that we have a third choice, many of them in government. It's called an interventionist policy. But they say that somehow you can mix the best of socialism, if there is such a thing, and the best of capitalism and thus have a regulated and a planned economy with government dictating and regulating, and this will stop short of full socialism. It's just a little longer way in arriving at socialism. Karl Marx didn't remove the women and children from slavery in the coal mines of England. The invention of machinery and the investment of capital in machinery did that. Not too many years ago, a Ford executive was going through the Cleveland assembly plant with the, the uh, late Walter Ruther. And he pointed to the great automated machines that were stamping out these parts for automobiles. And he said, Walter, you're going to have a hard time collecting dues from those machines. And Walter said, yes, and you're going to have a hard time selling cars to them. And they were both a little bit right. But what neither one of them thought to say is, those who had capital to invest in those machines, those who had control of private savings and money, could not only pay dues to whatever they wanted to pay dues to, they could also buy automobiles or anything else. Now a great many businesses in America are trying to get those on salary, they're working people, out where you are, in a sense private entrepreneurs, working yes, but owning a share of the business in which they work, so that they have a personal stake in the prosperity and the progress of that business. And where this has been done, productivity per man hour has increased 3% over the companies that haven't done it. That means something when you think that one-tenth of one percent increase in productivity means another billion dollars in the gross national product. Now, government could do a great deal to increase this practice if there was more statesmanship and less populist demagoguery in the halls of Congress. Real tax reform that would recognize that in that tax reform they could make it advantageous for all of business and industry to create millions of more capitalists in this country, individuals owning a share having a personal stake in prosperity. And this would be the practical answer to the empty promises of socialism. Now, I think the choice is very clear and the time is very short. Either we use the great vitality of the free enterprise system to save this way of life, or we face our children someday when they ask us where we were and what we were doing on the day that freedom was lost. 
And so I think it is time that we reply to those demagogues in government who've been appealing to the worst in us, not the best. Who down through the years have been appealing to the cupidity and selfishness and saying to each one of us, you deserve a bigger slice of the pie. And you can have a bigger slice of the pie if you will help us in government take some of the pie away from someone else who's getting more than their share. I think it is time for the people of this country to answer those demagogues by saying, we can all have a bigger slice of pie if government will get out of the way and let the free enterprise system take a bigger pie.